Hi friends, welcome to chapter 13, the delivery. So in this lecture, we will cover elements of effective delivery, the four common methods of delivering a speech, and various nonverbal components that we can include to enhance the effectiveness of our delivery. And then lastly, facilitating the question and answer session after presentations. Now, typically with this uh, Q&A session, it depends on, of course, the context of the speech. Um, predominantly in uh, our public speaking classes, uh, we will not include a Q&A uh, session. And obviously that looks different on uh, the online format. So, um, but this is a good information to know if you're conducting, you know, a presentation at a meeting or, you know, uh, something work related where you might have uh, follow up questions to your presentation. So, um, before we get started with the delivery, I want to um, remind you of something that I shared with you at the beginning of the semester. And that is that great speeches really include three things. The first one is excellent ideas. You know, in order to develop a excellent presentation or speech, um, we really have to brainstorm the topic and figure out a, a theme or direction that we're going to be taking uh, our topic or our presentation. And then the next thing is we have to really spend a lot of time planning out, you know, the ideas, the type of research we're going to be uh, including. And, and also that requires us to learn more about the topic and so engage in the research, explore what other people and other scholars have said about our topic. Now, after we develop excellent ideas, then we start working on the outline and structuring our speeches. So this is formulating a solid introduction. You know, so we, every, we already covered what goes in the introduction, you know, attention grabber, a purpose statement, like, you know, um, the, the topic we're gonna to be talking about, uh, the significance statement, you know, trying to relate the topic to the audience and, and communicate the significance this topic has for the audience. Next thing we wanna do is list our credibility, like what gives us the authority to speak on such a topic. And then the fifth step in the introduction is providing a preview statement where, where we tell the audience explicitly, I'm going to tell you X, Y, and Z, right? And then, we structure the body, you know, what type of organizational pattern are we going to take in structuring the main points? Are we going to take a chronological, topical, or sequential, uh, you know, or problem solution, problem cause solution approach? You know, all of that is planning uh, that goes into formulating excellent structure. And then in the conclusion, you know, do we develop a conclusion? Do we provide a summary of the main points we discussed? Do we conclude our speech in, uh, in, a, in a sophisticated way that adds more meaning to what we have just communicated to the audience? Uh, you know, does it, does it end in an impactful way? So once we have developed superior structure, then we can move into excellent delivery. And so this is the third component, what I believe makes an effective speech is the delivery. And this includes controlling nervousness. You know, we all experience nervousness. So what do we do with that nervousness? Do we try turning it into positive energy, you know, or excitement or enthusiasm for our topic? Or do we let that nervousness take control um, and, you know, uh, detract from our delivery? Are we direct with the audience? Do we use dynamic vocal and facial expressions really to add that expressiveness element of our speeches. So this is what we're going to be focusing on in this presentation is that third main point, excellent delivery. So let's talk about elements of excellent delivery. So good delivery can take uh, can make the difference between a successful speech and an unsuccessful speech. So what do we mean by this? 
Well, essentially, you've probably heard that saying, you know, actions speak louder than words, or, you know, or believe, we believe what we see, not necessarily what we hear. And to an, a certain extent, I would agree that a lot of the audiences that we confront in giving speeches will judge us simply based off of the nonverbal elements, the delivery portion of the speech. So don't interpret this as saying, okay, I can, you know, give a crappy speech, but as long as I do it eloquently, you know, I, I'll, I'll make an excellent uh, speech or a presentation. That's one thing that we want to uh, stay clear of. You know, back in Aristotle days, uh, you know, ancient Greek days, uh, these individuals were called uh, the, the sophists. And they essentially were um, almost like the, third, the, the first generation of lawyers. Um, they were very skilled at oral delivery of, you know, speeches. However, their philosophy, um, their reasoning, all of that was flawed. And so what happened was that over time, you had people, you know, using these very persuasive techniques, but not really uh, grounded in solid reasoning or argumentation. And as a result, you know, they, they paid more attention to the delivery, the eloquence of a speech, and not necessarily the content. And from that, you know, we, we experience you know, all sorts of uh, ramifications, you know, the, the spread of misinformation, disinformation, you know, uh, the distortion of truth, right? And these are things as ethical public speakers, we want to stay clear of. And so, you know, yes, delivery is, is extremely important, uh, but if we only have good delivery and the content just is not there in our speech, then what's the point? Now, on the contrary, you've probably experienced this as well in maybe one of your classes. Maybe you, you took a, a class with a professor who was extremely smart. They knew what they were doing. They were an expert in their field. But they couldn't translate that knowledge in a way that resonated with you. The delivery, the way they facilitated the class was, was not quite there. And as a result, you know, maybe you didn't pay attention. Maybe you weren't, uh, you know, captured by the lectures. And consequently, you know, maybe you didn't invest the time to be successful in that class. I've taken many, many classes like that, where I know the person facilitating the class is, you know, knowledgeable, the content is solid, but the delivery is lackluster. And as a result, I tuned out, I lost interest. And so we want to balance that, right? And so delivery can make and break a presentation, right? So speech delivery is based typically on nonverbal communication. This is uh, the speaker's use of voice and body to convey a message expressed by words. Now, you know, if you haven't taken a you know, in our personal communication class, you know, we dedicate a chapter on nonverbal communication. And so nonverbal communication is essentially messages expressed by non-linguistic means. And it could be anything such as, you know, our style, what we wear, our body posture, how close we sit to someone, the layout of the room, all of those different things can communicate meaning. Essentially, this is semiotics, uh, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. So good delivery is an art. You know, it's, it's something that we have to perfect. We aren't just naturally born as great speakers, right? It's a skill set. You know, we have to develop these skills over time. So it's an art. It conveys the speaker's messages clearly, interestingly, and without distracting the audience. And so, you know, with our speech delivery, we want to make sure that it's, you know, um, reinforcing our message. It, you know, adds a, a layer of dynamism to the presentation, but we don't want to get too caught up in the delivery that we, we distract the audience. 
So most audience preferred delivery that combines a certain degree of formality with the best attributes of good conversation, directness, vocal and facial expressiveness, and a lively sense of communication. So we want to balance that. Like, um, we want to be formal, but you know, if we're too formal to the point that we're stuffy and too rigid, then that might be off-putting to the audience. But if we're too informal and casual, then the audience doesn't take what we're saying serious. And so we have to try to find that balance point between, you know, the, the uh, similarities of conversations and public speaking. So let's talk about the four different types of method delivery. So the first delivery method is the manuscript. In manuscript speeches, this is essentially where a speaker reads a script. And it's often used in situations that require absolute accuracy of wording or that impose strict time limits upon the, the speaker. And so if you have, let's say, two minutes at tops to, to give your ideas, yeah, you're going to, you're going to, you know, probably write out your speech and read that so that you meet those time uh, requirements. In some situations, you know, in, in the courtroom, legality things, those require manuscript uh, delivery because accuracy of the wording is extremely important. So some tips on how to do this, practice reading your speech. Like, even though it's written down and you don't have to commit it to memory, practice, 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 right? Um, so that way it sounds more natural and you can identify areas where you can break from looking at the paper and engage in eye contact with the, the listeners. So what are the pros and cons of a manuscript delivery? Well, some of the pros is accuracy. It can lead to a dynamic delivery um, without having to memorize the speech. Now, some of the drawbacks to this, um, even though that you have the flexibility to, you know, write down the content on a piece of paper and read it to the audience, it's easy to lose connection with the audience. The audience may uh, tune out of, of a manuscript delivery type speech. Let's talk about memory. So memory, is when we deliver a speech from memory. <laughs> Whoa, uh, groundbreaking, right? Uh, the speaker should learn it so thoroughly that she or he can concentrate on communicating with the audience rather than remembering specific words. And so, you know, oftentimes when we memorize a speech, um, when we deliver it, it's not going to be verbatim. That means it's not going to be word for word for word. Uh, chances are we're going to memorize the main points, you know, the, the thing, the key phrases or quotes or, you know, things that we want to include. But when we are actually giving that presentation, it comes off as more conversational, right? So we might include maybe some filler words or we might pause or, you know, we might substitute, you know, certain words for, you know, things that come to mind more naturally. So this, uh, you know, when, when, you know, preparing this lecture, uh, recently I've been reading a lot of uh, Walter Ong's uh, work. And so he wrote a book called Orality and Literacy. And essentially Walter Ong argues that the development of written language, so think about like primary oral cultures that do not have any formal written language, like they don't, they don't write. They simply translate or transmit their, their culture through speaking. And in order to do that, right, that requires a, a, a significant skill set, right? And so Walter Ong is arguing that when society shifted from primary oral cultures into Latin, uh, literate cultures where they had written language, that changes some psychodynamics of the human consciousness in some distinct ways. And so written language, if you think about it, um, equals permanence, right? So 
um, when I stop talking, the the sound that I produce, that the the language that I'm talking, the the orality ceases to exist. But if I were to write something down, it is etched on a piece of paper or stone or tablet, you know, or now in my computer, and it's it, it essentially is is permanent until it's destroyed. And so written languages has transformed the way we think about, you know, uh, time and space and how we structure even our writing or even other things, you know, um, it also, it, you know, with writing, you know, uh, we can, we can put something down in writing it, you know, as permanent that frees up a lot of mental and cognitive energy and functioning to explore other deep, more abstract thoughts. You know, if you think about primary oral cultures are really their, their vocabulary, their, their language is really tied to their physical environment. Right. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, we, as humans, and I say we as humans, homo sapiens, were able to create written language that freed up their, um, you know, mental capacities to think about things that transcend the, spe uh, the spatial and temporal boundaries that often confine oral cultures. And so I thought that was uh, really interesting. However, there's a caveat. So because we are putting things down on paper, right, um, which is great, you know, it's uh, permanent, you know, we can send that paper all over the world and spread our, our ideas, you know, we can think about abstract things. It actually decreases our ability to hold things in memory for a long period of time. So think about being in a primary oral culture, you know, where their history is preserved because of the, the narratives that they use, because of maybe the, the one person in the tribe dedicated to just remembering everything of their ancestries um, and passing that down. You know, that, I don't know about you, that that would take a lot of memorization and just energy, cognitive energy. And so as a result, you know, uh, I guess what I'm getting at is Walter Ong would argue that we all suck at memorization right now is because written language, putting it down on paper is great, but it's harder maybe to commit to memory. Um, so what does that have to do with uh, public speaking? Well, typically anymore nowadays, uh, a lot of people are, aren't expecting speakers to commit their speeches to memory unless if it's a short, you know, maybe two minute speech or some sort of ceremonial speech, you know, so the, the wedding speech that I uh, uh, showed, you know, I had probably 98% of that memorized. Um, and the last little bit, I actually read that, that quote or the, the blessing or um, the final toast is because I didn't want to screw that up. Like accuracy was important. So that was like really my only note, co note card that I had in that uh, presentation. So uh, the next type of delivery method we have is impromptu. Impromptu speeches are presented with little or no immediate preparation. So chances are we're going to run in situations where we are asked on the spot to give some sort of presentation. Now these presentations tend to be pretty brief. So you might be a, at a work meeting and your boss says, you know, hey, can you uh, discuss this aspect? You know, and so you get up in front of the group, you have to give some sort of impromptu speech. So when speakers find themselves faced with an impromptu speaking situation, they should follow four simple steps to organize their thoughts quickly, right? And so at the end of the semester, you're gonna know that a speech has an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. You're gonna know what goes in the introduction, how to structure your body or the main points, and then the things you need to include in a conclusion. So if you can just remember basic structure, 
you know, you can conquer, you can, uh, you know, develop or execute a successful impromptu speech that sounds like you've prepared in advance. So the first thing that you want to do is, you know, state the, the points that you are going to respond to. So if someone asks, asks you a question, you know, like, oh, uh, can you discuss, you know, some of the things that your department is doing, you know, in this quarter? Um, and then so you would give up and say, great, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this. Um, you know, there are three things that I would like to share with you uh, today in how our department is, is responding to the current crisis. You know, one, two, and three. Boom. Second, they should state the points that they want to make. So again, tell the audience what you're going to be telling them. Third, you should use whatever support uh, you have, examples, statistics, testimonies, to prove that point or the points that you make. And then lastly, summarize the main points. So this is very basic. You know, essentially tell the audience what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell the audience what you just told them, you know, summarize. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the fourth method of delivery, extemporaneous delivery. Essentially, this is what we've been doing this whole semester. These speeches are carefully prepared and practiced in advance. They are presented from a set of notes, but the exact wording is chosen at the moment of delivery. So pretty much, um, I would say 99% of the lectures that I give are extemporaneous. So I know this, this material, um, but the words that I'm choosing right now are things that I'm just choosing in the moment. It's not like I write out a script and I read it might be more effective that <laughs> uh, of that way um, probably eliminate a lot of the rambling like i'm doing right now but it is what it is so there are several advantages to extemporaneous delivery so first it gives greater control over ideas and language than impromptu delivery so you can really figure out like who's going to be in the audience what type of language should i be using what would be appropriate <laughs> You know, you have the luxury of planning out in detail your speech. It allows for greater spontaneity and uh, directness than memorized or manuscript delivery. And so in the moment, you can really get a feel for how the audience is responding to your speech and adapt. You know, when you have something memorized or when you're reading from a script, it's extremely difficult to deviate from that in order to, you know, bring the audience into to the speech. And so, yes, it is more flexible, more spontaneous, um, and we can really get more direct with the audience, you know, to, to, to create an, an atmosphere that reflects more of a conversational approach. Um, and then it encourages the uh, conversational vocal qualities, natural gestures, and strong eye contact. So a lot of benefits to extemporaneous delivery. So let's go ahead and move into nonverbal communication, how that uh, is related to delivery of our speeches. So we know that nonverbal communication are messages expressed by non-linguistic means. Some old school research found that 93% of the emotional impact of a message stems from nonverbal sources. So this is like, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And to a certain extent, I would, again, agree to that. But I do think that what you say is important. You know, if you're just up there, if someone's up there spouting a bunch of rubbish, and you know they're doing all the the eloquence you know it's complete crap it's rubbish right um but if we aren't adding that emotional appeal or the 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 nonverbal you know communication the the dynamic to our presentation that it's like no one's going to pay attention so this is essentially we believe what we see actions speak louder than words all nonverbal behavior has communicative value so keep that in mind as a speaker when you are recording yourself or presenting in front of a live audience 
everything about you is going to communicate something to the audience. You know, if we're five minutes late to a presentation, you know, they're going to, the audience is going to interpret that uh, one way or the other. You know, if we're wearing a particular, uh, you know, outfit, people are going to judge us based on that, right? And this is really pointing towards Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message. And so he was a Canadian uh, media ecologist uh, back in, I think it was, uh, what, uh, 60s, uh, 50s, 60s. Um, and he would argue that it's not necessarily the message of a particular medium, but it's the actual channel that we use to communicate, which is the real message. And so, you know, think about texting versus a phone call. You know, it's more meaningful to pick up the, the phone and call someone uh, and say, you know, happy birthday, miss you, hope you're doing well, than just texting it. You know, same thing, like with, you know, uh, breaking up someone over a text message. It's not the, the message that really matters. It's the way we communicate that has a profound impact on the interpretation, the results. And this is kind of what uh, Marshall McLuhan's getting at. And so this is, so as public speakers, again, you know, it's not necessarily what we're saying that's gonna just change the audience perspective, but it's how we do it, right? And that's what we're going to get into with nonverbal communication. So here's a, a, br a brief breakdown of the typology of nonverbal communication. So essentially we have proxemics. And this is uh, essentially how we use space, distance, territoriality that can be interpreted as communication. So how close are you standing to the audience? How far away are you standing from someone? You know, uh, who's in, in your intimate space? Who's, you know, in your public space? You know, um, all of these things are a form of communication, you know. Um, so if you sit right next to someone in an open area with plenty of seating, chances are that's going to violate their, their personal space, right? And so what does that mean? What is, what is that, that communicative uh, behavior? Um, and so that's what essentially what proxemics, the field of nonverbal study looks at. Chronemics is the structure and use of time. And so again, you know, we could look at how time is communicating or how people use time in a way that communicates. We could look at physical characteristics. This could be everything about us, you know, our facial uh, expressions, how we comb our hair, you know, the, the type of accessories we use, right? Um, our, our, you know, body posture and so forth. Uh, canine six are body movement. So what we do with our body, you know, how we uh, stand, you know, are we hunched over? Are we trying to make ourselves, you know, small, right? These are uh, body movements that can communicate um, meaning. Haptic is the, the study of touch and how touch is an important form of uh, communication. Vocalics is the study of all the vocal properties other than language or the vocabulary we use. So this is called paralanguage. So think about language. Th these are the words that we're saying, but paralanguage are all the elements of the voice that influence the interpretation of that language. So it might include pitch, volume, intonation patterns, all of those things. So we'll talk about that more specifically because that's really relevant to us as speakers. Uh, artifacts, this is a semiotic. So this is the study of symbols and signs and how they're used to communicate and the interpretations that people uh, derive based on those signs and symbols. And then the environment. You know, uh, beginning of the semester, we talked about uh, recording an online speech and how, you know, your environment is so important for shaping the, the overall feel of your presentation. You know, so we talked about backdrop, how to level, you know, your camera so it's, you know, eye level and so forth, like, you know, what to wear, all of those things. 
Okay, so as speakers, we are really interested in really two things, our body, body posture and movement, and our voice, right, our vocalics. And so vocalics are the characteristics of your voice. And really, we should use vocalics in order to enhance pathos. Pathos is the emotional appeals that we use in our speeches to draw the audience in. Right. And so some characteristics include volume. It could be soft or loud. Now, when fluctuating our volume, this just might be a, you know, a very practical, functional thing that we have to do. Maybe you know, we are far away from the audience and we have to you know, project our voice, or maybe the microphone isn't uh, working. Or we could increase or decrease our volume throughout the speech. So maybe our attention grabber, we might uh, say something a little bit more loud and then decrease slowly the volume until our first main point. Or rate, what do you think the rate of speech might communicate? You know, if we are talking at a slow rate, you know, the, the, the low pitch, you know, this could communicate solemnness. It could uh, add emphasis to what we're saying. But if I increase the volume and increase the rate of speech, then I'm probably communicating enthusiasm, passion, excitement, all of those things, right? Uh, so, you know, the volume, the pitch, the rate, all of these things that we include, even pauses, you know, we can add pauses to really enhance the dramatic feel of our presentation. Isn't that amazing? Right? I just use some pauses. So pauses can create emphasis. So when we combine all these things, we call that vocal variety. Um, and so this is when we change the rate, the pitch, the volume, add pauses, really to communicate emotion and really to avoid a monotone delivery. Some other things the book talks about is pronunciation, using correct word choice, um, and articulation, you know, being able to articulate, uh, you know, form our, our verbiage. Um, so with uh, pronunciation, I know this has been a struggle for me personally, you know, as one with uh, dyslexia, like I read things, I know what they are, but, you know, translating it into uh, the pronunciation, like I, I really struggle with that. And so sometimes what I will do is even with students' names, sometimes like before the semester, chances are I looked up all the correct pronunciation <laughs> of your names just to make sure I had it right. Uh, but I'll look up the correct pronunciation of words. And if it's too difficult, if I know that, you know, that word would cause a stumbling block for me in my presentation, then I replace it with something else that uh, is more natural to me, right? And the only way I can do that is if I spend enough time doing preparation, rehearsing, practicing, going back and then editing and figuring out what works and what doesn't. So really practice the delivery, the vocalics of your presentation. So we talked about vocalics. The next thing that is important to us is the speaker's body. Um, so the book says that, you know, this includes personal appearance, the movements of our body, gestures, and eye contact. So with personal appearance, appearance keep it neat and clean. Um, that's all I'm going to say about personal uh, appearances. Like, I'm not here to tell you, like, how to style your hair, what makeup to wear, you know, or, you know, uh, you know what type of outfit to wear. But just keep in mind, everything about you is communicating something. And so if you want to enhance your credibility as a speaker, if you want the audience to take you seriously, then I would suggest, you know, being more formal in how you conduct yourself. You know, this is, includes everything to, you know, what you wear, how, you know, uh, personal hygiene, um, and also the way you speak. Right. So, again, if you're looking for credibility, 
it's always good to enhance the formality of our delivery. Um, when we are entering in speaking engagements that we are unfamiliar or we don't have enough information on, it's always best to err on the side of formality than you know, coming up short and being too casual. You know, we can always tone it down. It's just hard to, you know, develop that, that formality uh, in a situation. Movement. So when we move as speakers during our presentation, we want to keep them natural and effective. So don't do any body movements that are going to detract from your speech. All right. Make sure that they, you know, have purpose and they uh, are effective. Gestures, you know, when we use our hands to gesture, keep them crisp and powerful. You know, so if you're asking the audience, you know, what a, a question, you want them to respond with a show of hands, you might say, with a show of hands, how many of us have eaten breakfast today? Right? Um, or when you say, you know, the, the, the fish that I caught at least was two feet long, right? And so you're using these gestures uh, to emphasize uh, what you're actually saying. So make sure that they're crisp and powerful. Eye contact, you know, at least keep 90% of, of the time of your speech engaged in eye contact. Now, some of the things that you might think about as a speaker, and, um, you know, we, we really won't be doing uh, this in this virtual um, online uh, situation, primarily because uh, our body movements are constricted to the view of our webcam. So we don't want to be moving around too much. We want to uh, pretty much uh, stay um, motionless uh, for the most, uh, uh, not motionless, but we, uh, we want to um, not engage in a lot of distracting behavior. So if we're sitting down, you know, we don't want to be uh, twisting in a chair. You know, if we're standing up, we don't want to be like bobbing around or shifting to where we get out of uh, out of uh, view. But if we're giving a presentation in front of a classroom, one thing that we could do is this uh, the uh, triangle of movement. Uh, at least that's what I call it. Um, I don't know if there's any formal label to this. But essentially, you know, uh, on this diagram here, uh, let's say, you know, this is the front of the uh, auditorium or the place, the classroom that you're giving a presentation. And down here is where the audience is. So you could start, you know, up here. And so we could give our presentation, you know, really close uh, to the audience. And then after our introduction, we might move back a few steps over to uh, the left hand side of the stage or the classroom, uh, give our main point here. And then, you know, when we're transitioning, we could take a few steps over here and address these folks in the classroom and give our main point B. And then we might take a few steps forward to deliver our third main point and conclude our presentation. So this is a very uh, effective way to make, to integrate some movements into our speeches um, and, and take a few steps so that way it looks uh, natural. Now, of course, if we have a podium there and if we're doing a manuscript delivery, you know, chances are you can't really do too much movement. Okay, so some tips for Q and A's. So formulate answers to possible questions. So you wanna think what type of questions would the audience have at the end of my presentation? Make a list of those. Um, jot down a few notes on how you would answer those questions and practice the delivery. Approach the Q&A with positive attitude. So a lot of people hate Q&As because they feel like they're being put on the spot and they can't predict the type of questions uh, that the audience are going to ask. Completely natural. So think of it as, you know, got to do it. Might as well have fun with it, right? But in the Q&A session, you want to really listen 
carefully to the questions that are being asked. And when, when someone is asking you that question, it's perfectly, perfectly acceptable to restate that question back to the person. So you, so essentially they're like, what are the implications of your speech and how does it impact me? So you might say, excellent question. So if I understand you correctly, you want to know how is this topic relevant to you and your life? You know, and by, by restating that question back, now you can start thinking like, oh sh shoot, like how am I, gonna, how am I gonna answer this, right? Um, be direct with your answers and direct the answers to the entire audience, not just that one person. Be honest and straightforward. There will be situations where people ask you a question and you will not know the answer. Um, this happens to me all the time. You know, when I first started teaching, I thought I had to know all the answers all at once. And, you know, the, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, the first the first semester that I taught, like, you know, I, I, I don't want to say I BS my way, but um, I tried answering every question, even if I didn't know what I was talking about. And I learned very quickly that it's best to be like, you know what, excellent question. I don't have the answer for you right now, but you know, maybe we can talk after this session, or if you give me your contact, I can research it and get back to you. You know, that is so much more meaningful than, you know, trying to create an answer that people generally can tell like, oh, they're just making that up. So be honest and straightforward, it's okay. You can simply say something like, Oh, that question is beyond uh, the scope of my research that I conducted for this presentation. You know, that's a fancy way of saying you're asking something that I did not research and I don't have an answer for you. You could just simply say, oh, that's beyond the scope of the research I did for this presentation. Um, stay on track. Uh, some people are going to ask questions that you know, try derailing us or is just not related to our topic. So again, you can say, excellent question. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, this is the, the topic that we're going to be focused on. So in conclusion of, you know, chapter 13, uh, the delivery, good delivery is critical for effective presentations, right? Uh, balance between excellent content, uh, excellent con, Tent and excellent delivery. So again, you know, just don't try developing the delivery, but the content of the speech is underdeveloped. Again, we want to move past of developing superior content, but not really being able to, to deliver on that content. So we want to try finding the balance. Plan ahead and practice. You know, the, the, the more time you have to prepare a speech, run through it a few times, figure out what, you know, works, what doesn't, then you can really start creating an effective and engaging, excellent presentation. Um, and the, lastly, I wanted to share this uh, quote, and that is, people remember a third of what they read, half of what people tell them, but 100% of what they feel. And a large part of how we make people feel in our presentations is through the delivery. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.